Hey, this is David, pastor of Hamilton Life, and I want to thank you for taking a listen to our podcast. For more information on our church and how you can support the ministry, you can visit us online at hamiltonlifechurch.com. Thanks again for taking a listen, and we hope you enjoy the podcast today. And uh, the idea behind Epiphany is that I truly believe wholeheartedly that God uh, is in the ordinary and the normative, and yet we miss him all the time. And what an Epiphany is, is it's this sudden revelation. It's this realization that, that something has been transpiring or something has happened that's remarkable, that maybe it's been there the whole time. And the reason we have Epiphany in the liturgical calendar is because uh, it's the celebration of the Magi discovering Jesus. Now, we don't want to go back to Christmas because hopefully your trees are up and your lights are off your house. If not, there's no judgment here. But the idea is that the Magi discovered Jesus and they had this epiphany that what they've been looking for all along was right there. And I believe what you've been searching for in your life is right here. I believe it's right in front of you. But what I believe to be true is that so many of us go searching, but we're distracted searchers. Have you ever been on a hike and you got lost, you got sidetracked, you got, you got mixed up in your directions and you didn't know which way you were going? See, I think a lot of us are distracted. And we feel like we're trying to pursue God, but we have all of these distractions in front of us that are preventing us from seeing God in our everyday lives. And so what we did last week was we started a 21-day prayer and fasting or communication and sacrifice. And we said for the next 21 days, we're going to commit together as a tribe of people to pray and to fast, to communicate with God on a regular basis Eight and eight, and we're going to sacrifice. We're finding some distraction that's in our lives, and we're going to remove itself from us. And uh, for me, I'll just tell you my, my sacrifice. One of them has been social media. That's really hard. I keep getting notifications, and I'm not checking them. I'm fighting checking the notifications because that's a distraction in my life. Uh, For others, it may be something else, television or, or coffee. Whatever it is, we're removing those things. And we're carving out time. I just got a notification at 8 this morning to pray, and I did, and I'll get one again at 8 p.m. Because here's what I've found to be true in my life is that I'm not seeing Jesus in my everyday life because I'm not carving out time and space for me to see him. And I'm going through life looking and asking, but I'm not actually stopping and and waiting. And I believe every day at 8 and 8, and for you that might be 7 and 7 or 6 and 6 or whatever, every day if we'll just stop and go, God, where are you? God, what are you doing? We've been walking through the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples that says this. It says, uh, whenever you pray, say, Father, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us of our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone in debt to us, and bring us, and do not bring us, rather, into temptation. That we've been carving out, ideally, if you've been working with me, we've been working together to carve out distractions and to really find God in our everyday life. But I don't believe that prayer is just for us. I don't believe that prayer is just for you to connect with God. I don't believe that prayer is just so that you can have an epiphany. It's not enough for me to have an epiphany about who God is and no one else discover him. See, I believe prayer is this connection, this communication that allows me to see God for who he is. But I also believe it's an opportunity for me to help others see God for who he is as well. And I believe the question we have to ask ourselves is, is my relationship with God all about what I am asking God to do for me rather than what God is asking me to do for others? Is your relationship with God all about what God can do for you? Or is it possible that it's about what God is inviting you to do for others? See, I don't want a selfish relationship. I don't want a selfish marriage. My wife does. That's why she married me. I don't want want a selfish friendship. I don't want selfishness in my life. I want mutual agreement. I want community. I want give and take. And I believe when we approach God, we should approach God for our own needs. But it should not stop there. See, I believe if you and I understand the power that we possess in prayer, if we understand the great power that we wield, that we have communication with the Almighty That God hears our prayers. There's a few instances in scriptures where it talks about that he doesn't hear our prayers. But if you're aligning your life with God and you're righteous and you're you're, you're crying out to him in earnesty, God hears your prayers. So if we know that God hears your prayers, then we should ask him on behalf of others to meet the needs around us. 
And I feel like that's our responsibility. I feel like that's our opportunity. That a lot of us, we have this uh, inner circle of communication, right? Like there's just a handful of people in your life that no matter what happens, you're going to answer the call, right? Do you guys, can you think of somebody it's like a parent or a loved one? It doesn't matter what's going on. You get a text, you get a phone call. It's immediate. You're also going to respond immediately, right? You just, you understand. Now, there's some people in your life, and I might be one of them where, you know, I call or text, you're going to get to me. You're going to get back eventually. It's coming. Uh, and I know I owe a few people text too, so sorry. But the idea is that there are certain people that you're not going to ignore. But isn't it interesting how when you reach out to people that you're not going to ignore, but they kind of ignore you a little bit? Like if you're like, I would answer the phone immediately when you call, but you haven't quite answered my phone call. I mean, maybe their phone's dead, right? My wife's phone's dead quite often. The idea is that I would drop anything. But would they drop anything for you? See, I feel like sometimes when we connect with God and we communicate with God, he's dropping everything to hear from you. But I wonder how many times are we setting aside time to actually hear from him? See, I don't think communication's one-sided. It actually goes both ways, that God is inviting us to look past the way we see his, our relationship with him and not just what we can get from him, but what we have to offer the world. And I think we only reach out to God when it's our agenda. And I catch myself doing this all the time. That I only want to reach out to God when I need something from him. But the idea of prayer is so much deeper and so much greater that we have consistent communication with God. That the more we get from God, I believe the more we get of God. And so there's this passage in 1 Timothy. Because I believe the epiphany that I want us to have today is that I want you to realize that prayer is not just for you. That prayer is not just for us in this community. Prayer is not just for followers of Christ, that it goes beyond that. And so in 1 Timothy 2, we find this passage. And it says, first of all, then I urge the petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all of those who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and it pleases God, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. See, I think when we talk about prayer, and we realize the power of prayer, that all of a sudden our natural instinct is to start praying for people that we like. I like you, I'll pray for you. You, not so much not really going to think about you. Family. I'm going to pray for my family because I, we're, we're in a relationship. We're community. You'll pray for the people that you know, the people that you're seeing. You'll pray for politicians that you agree with. Hasn't that been interesting lately? We're going to pray for our president because you might align with them. The idea isn't that we pray for our kings that we like as much as it is that we pray for the kings we don't like. It isn't so much that we pray for the people that we love or are close to or in close proximity, but that we actually move prayer beyond people that we're in, in relationship with. Our, even our enemies need prayer. In fact, they might need more prayer. Even our enemies need us to intercede, to be conduits. So they need us to step in. And, and what I love about this passage, and we won't spend much more time on it, but I love that it begins to break prayer down again into categories. So last week we talked about uh, petitioning and, uh, and forgiveness. I'm getting these all out of order. But we talked about the, the, the four basic categories of prayer that help lead us into prayer. But this also begins to describe petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings. This begins to describe a couple of very key details about prayer that so many of us miss because we do believe prayer is communication with God. And, and I want to make prayer as simple as possible because I think we, we, we make it mysterious and difficult and challenging. Prayer is you talking to God, but I also think in our ability to make it simple, we stop feeling the weight and the gravity that our conversations with God actually carries. And so I believe when we understand this power of petitions and prayers, intercessions, that we go to bat for one another that we have a responsibility and also an opportunity to go to bat for one another, for people we agree with and disagree with, people we love and people that we hate. That what I love about praying for people that I hate is that God hardly ever removes them from my life. But in praying for people that I despise, God ends up changing my perspective of who they are and it ends up changing our relationship. When you pray for your enemies, it's less that your enemies change, but the way you relate to your enemies is shifted and changes. So I think it's important that we understand that we don't just pray for ourselves, that we don't just pray for our community, for the people that we're in relationship with, but we pray for people beyond our circle of influence. And in Acts 3, 
which is where we'll stay for the remainder of the, the, our time together. Uh, in Acts 3, 1, what we find is two of Jesus' disciples, Peter and John, they're heading to church and they're heading to pray, and they came across a man in need. And in verse 1, it says, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple complex at the hour of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. And the man who was lame from birth was carried there and placed every day at the temple gate called Beautiful so that he could beg from those entering the temple complex. But when he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple, he asked for help. Peter, along with John, looked at him intently and said, Look at us! So he turned to them, expecting to get something from them. But Peter said, I don't have silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And then taking him by the right hand, he raised him up. And at once, his feet and ankles became strong again. I like this passage. I like this story. I like the unfolding of this event because it says so much about how we conduct our lives. I don't know how you see yourself, but if you consider yourself to be a follower of Christ, I need you to know that being a Christian or a follower of Jesus involves more than what we're doing right here. It's more than gathering together for an hour service and singing some songs and listening to a witty pastor and then leaving and going to lunch and then going back. You can have laughed, but you didn't, so that makes it uncomfortable. Then you go back and you do other things. And so we often imagine that church is this and being a Christian is this. And so I have one hour to be a Christian. And man, wouldn't that be really easy if that were the case? But see, what I believe this hour of our time together means for me is that it's a hour of potential miracles, where what happens here is we get filled, and we get inspired, and we get encouraged, and whatever has been beaten out of us through the week, whether it's hope, or love, or peace, or joy, we get filled with those things again, those attributes, so that we can pour ourselves out into the people that we come into contact with. But see, what happens for a lot of us is that we get so full of stuff that we don't pour anything out, and we just end up overloaded, and that's not God's intention. It's not God's intention for you to take all of this information and to, to take what God is doing in your heart and feel love and hope and excitement and then leave and then hold on to that until you come back and then feel just a little more hope and love and joy and peace. And then a little more. That's how we, get, that's how we gain weight. The idea is that God's intention is for us to pour that out into others, that when you come into this space, you should walk in empty. We should walk in having poured everything that we have out to the last drop, having given to everyone in need, everyone who asks, everyone around us, so that we walk into this space saying, God, I have nothing, but I invite you to give me everything. And I feel like so often we don't understand the importance that following Christ plays in our community. It's important here, and we enjoy meeting together, but it's so much more important what we do outside these walls, and Peter and John understood this. This epiphany moment takes place when Peter and John recognize that the person that was sitting right there by this gate had a need. I wonder how many times they passed this guy. I wonder how many times they had seen the guy out of the corner of their eye and thought, don't make eye contact because then I have to do something. I have to say hi. Just keep you put your headphones in, right? That's, that's a trick people do sometimes. Just I'm going to put the earbuds in, and that's the universal sign for leave me alone, and I'm just going to keep going. And they pass him, I'm sure, a dozen times or more. And one day they had this epiphany moment of, oh, wow, there's somebody in need. See, I wonder how many epiphany moments we're missing because we have our headphones in and we're focused on doing our will and our agenda. And we're missing what God is revealing to us with the people around us. That I love this idea that they didn't have anything monetary to give. I relate so much to Peter and John. They didn't have any money to give, yet they still had something. See, you don't have to have money to give the people that you come into contact with in our city who are begging. See, they're begging for money. What they don't recognize is they're actually asking for something so much more. And we have that to give them. If you've come into a space like this or you've spent time with God on your own, you've been in prayer, and you've been reading your scriptures, you have this great gift. Now it's the opportunity for us to pour that out into people around us. And so often we don't recognize the needs of others because we're not looking. And that's exactly what an epiphany is. It's realizing who Jesus is and what he's capable of doing and recognizing the needs of the people around us and connecting the two, connecting who Jesus is and connecting the people around us. And I believe that we've been invited into this divine opportunity to pray for those who cannot pray for themselves. 
that we have a divine opportunity, not just an opportunity. You didn't win a cruise. You have a divine opportunity. God has divinely called you to this opportunity to connect people to him that I believe we have to stop viewing prayer as a way to get something from God and start using prayer as a way to get to know God better. And when we do that, all of a sudden we start seeing people the way God sees them. We start seeing needs the way God sees them. We start seeing our problems and our complications that are in front of us as conquerable because we understand who God is. And so the first thing I think we have to do in order to begin to pray for others, in order to help other people, is we have to be courageous. Everybody say be courageous. Be courageous. So you didn't sound courageous, but I believed you. Be courageous. Okay, yeah, so we're getting there. We're getting there. We're going to be courageous. The idea is that we have to be courageous. Courage is not something I think we're born with. Maybe some of you are, but it's not something I was born with. In Acts 3, 4, it says, Peter, along with John, looked at him intently. I love this word intently. Intently, it just says everything you need to know. Like, I can look at you, but if I looked at you intently... You know you're being looked at, right? There's just something serious about it. There's just some passion to it. It says they looked at him intently and they said, look at us. See, I feel like there's a certain level of comfort that we all tend to live with. And none of us want to step outside of that level of comfort because we refuse to look foolish or dumb. We refuse to look ignorant. And so it's easier for you and me to stay in our own lane, to stay in our box, to only speak to the people we normally speak to who already know that we're dumb and lame. And we just kind of stay in that sort of circle so we don't get outside so that we don't get made fun of or don't ostracize ourselves or don't start looking weird or different. But here's what's interesting about you and me is that you can't be an important and life-changing presence for some people without being a joke to others. That you can't step out and, and, and pray for others and, 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 and intercede for others and be a life change to others and not be a joke to some. That's just the reality of being a human being. You would think we would learn that through middle school, but then we carry it into high school, and then we end up being adults, and we start thinking everybody should like us, but not everyone's going to like you. So what we do is we recluse back into our own self, and we don't put ourselves out there so that we don't ever get rejected. But in doing that, we miss the opportunity to be valuable and important to somebody else, that I feel like we have to be willing to put ourselves out there, that that's exactly what intercession is. Intercession is putting yourself in God's place. It's stepping out and, and being a conduit to connect other people to God. And this can take place at any point, in any place, at anywhere we find ourselves. We have the opportunity. Now, there are certain ways that we can do this and and be that, that person, that, that odd person who, who steps out and prays for you. And I feel like a lot of us try to avoid being that person so much that we, we miss the opportunity to be that important person in someone's life. That I think we have an opportunity when someone says that they're dealing with something or struggling with something to go, let's pray. Let's just pray. I'll tell you a very real and very honest and very recent example is that uh, Miss Terry Whiteside, who is our... Uh, She's our outreach coordinator. She was here this morning. She came by to drop off um, something, and then uh, she's going to another church this morning to talk about Haiti. She's going to be a, a light, and her voice was struggling. And I heard very clearly, pray for her before she goes. And I didn't. And I'm talking about prayer, <laughs> and I'm encouraging you to pray for people. And I missed an opportunity. I wasn't nervous or scared. I pray in front of people periodically. I was busy. So hopefully she does a good job. If not, it's on me. The idea, though, is that how easy is it for us to miss the opportunities right in front of us? Just drop. If your own pastor is missing an opportunity to pray for someone else who volunteers here as a staff member, then how many more opportunities are we missing to help be a light in the lives of people around us? That this is our responsibility, but this is our opportunity. But the difference is we've got to be courageous. We've got to be willing to step out there. And I believe there's a great deal of power in just a few seconds of prayer. Just taking a second and going, hey, let me pray for you. Now, you may not always encounter people who understand prayer. So what I've found is that you can say, hey, would you mind if I prayed with you? Or you could say, hey, I believe in God, and I believe that God hears my prayers, and I believe that when I ask him for things, he hears me and he answers them. So would you mind if I asked him on behalf of you? That there are some polite ways to be able to enter into prayer instead of just, you know, I'm going to pray for you. But you can sort of walk into that and go, hey, let's just talk to God. And communicate, I believe it sends a message, but we have to be courageous. The second thing we have to do is we have to be concerned. We have to be concerned. As human beings, I believe concern is something that we should all be working on and working towards. That I'm concerned 
for myself. I'm deeply concerned for my family. I'm deeply concerned for a couple of people that I'm close to. But the idea is that God wants to expand our concern to all humanity. And in Acts 3, 2, it says, A man who was lame from birth was carried there and placed every day at the temple gate called Beautiful. So he could beg for those entering the complex. Now, what I love about this temple is that this temple is called beautiful. Here we have a lame man sitting in front of a temple called beautiful or a gate called beautiful. That I believe this is a metaphor for our lives that God sees beauty in our brokenness. He sees beauty in our brokenness because he sees opportunity to show himself, to give us that epiphany moment. And so I feel like when we're broken we kind of hide back. We want to hide our brokenness. I want to hide my dysfunction. I want to hide my shame. I want to hide my missed opportunities to pray for people that are close to me. And I don't want to share those. I don't want people seeing how broken I am. I just want you to see me for being perfect and wonderful. And yet what Jesus does is he puts the worst and the most broken right at the gate called beautiful because that's how he sees us, that our brokenness is his opportunity to prove to us that he loves us. And so we have to be concerned. We have to be concerned about others' well-beings more than ourselves. And there's a few ways we find concern. One of those is is by simply asking someone, just, hey, I'm concerned for you. Can I pray for you? Is there something I can do for you? Is there a way that I can can go to God on your behalf? What do you need? What can I pray for you uh, regarding? Because this works kind of oddly as uh, when strangers are in, in contact, I think a lot of times it becomes easier to just get in relationship with people. To just get in a relationship, the closer you get to people, the more you understand when there's a weight on them. You can see it. You can objectively see that they're carrying something. And you can go, hey, I see that there's something heavy. I don't need to know what it is. I just want you to know that I'm praying for you. Do you know how big of an encouragement that is to have somebody look you in the eye and say, I'm praying for you? Especially when you know they mean it. You have to mean it. You can tell when someone doesn't mean it. So if you don't mean it, don't say it. But the idea is that when someone looks you in the eye, you just feel like there's hope. You're seeing Jesus in, in, in human form. When someone looks you in the eyes and says, I'm here for you, I'm praying for you, I'm going to bat for you, so we have to be involved in one another's lives. The other way that we can begin to find others' needs is we need to understand that if they're human beings, they have needs. That if a human, our, our, our kids are walking out, they're going to a special compassion thing that's more important than this. There are needs around us. If you're breathing, you have a need. If you're alive, if you have flesh, if you have air in your lungs, you have need. We need to begin to understand that the people that we come into contact with may not overtly say they have a need, and they may not look like they're carrying a burden, but you can guarantee they have something going on in their life that needs God's attention. And so we just start praying. Lastly, I believe we have to be courageous, concerned, and lastly, we have to be connected. We have to be connected. There's something very important about connection, about human connection, that we talk a lot about family and and tribe But I believe that on Sundays, it's a lot easier to stay home. You don't understand that because you're here today. But you understand that next Sunday because it's a lot easier to stay home. It's a lot easier to go, man, it's rainy out and and winter's here finally, I guess, maybe this second. And then so it's cold and and I'm going to stay home. It's easier to stay home. It's easy to go, well, I've heard the songs that they're going to sing, and I've, I've heard all of David's bad jokes, and I'm, I've, I've seen, you know, everything. I'm just going to, I'm going to stay home this week, and I understand there are times when we need to. However, what I feel like is most valuable in our gathering together is two things. One is us taking communion together. But the most valuable thing we can do is take communion together, because what communion does is it points us to Christ, and it points us to one another. It connects us together. That if you just come here on a Sunday you nap through service, and you take communion with me, I'll be happy. Because the idea is that we come to the table of the Lord so that we can both connect to God and to one another because being connected is critical. And the only way that we can really be connected is spending time with one another. is is evident, and and when we spend more time with one another, we become more connected. And our men, we uh, gathered for breakfast Thursday at an ungodly hour. It was 5, 6 a.m. Some had to get up at 5, and it was just bad, but... It was so good. You know, you have those mornings where you're like too sleepy to really care, but then you get there and you're like, oh, this is just great. Everybody had a couple of coffee cups and uh, then we were all chatty. It was so, we had 10 guys just gathering together around the Cracker Barrel table. We opened it up. 
It was closed, and we were like shaking the door. And they opened it up for us, and we sat together around a table, and we just talked and shared, and it was beautiful. There was no agenda. There was no prayer that I can remember. Maybe somebody prayed for food. Uh, but what I do know is that we were connecting. We were building a connection. We were eyeball to eyeball, not just digital stuff where, you know, the kids do it, where they text and stuff. This was like human, real, old t- connection where we were just talking that I believe there's so much power in us connecting that it ends up building something so much more sustainable, but it's not comfortable. It's not comfortable to be in community together. And that's why so many people end up trading communities for others. When it becomes uncomfortable, they trade communities for another community. So they'll get involved in a community, and then when something transpires, or maybe when it becomes uncomfortable, all of a sudden they don't feel like they fit in, they think, I'll find another community. I don't know if you've been married, but if you've been married, you know that the honeymoon's pretty awesome. Then my wife and I, for a week, we went to Cancun, Mexico, and it was pretty beautiful. If that was a snapshot of our marriage, that would be fantastic, only that was a snapshot of our honeymoon. The idea was that we got back home, we had to get jobs, we had to uh, work jobs, I had to get a job, we had to pay bills, we had to, you know, do stuff, we had kids, and then we had stuff from that, and, and, and all of a sudden, real life is not sitting in a hammock on the beach. Real life is uncomfortable, and I feel like a lot of us enter into community or connection with one another, thinking it's like that honeymoon. And that's why so many people don't stay in the local church for very long, because they honeymoon here, then they honeymoon here, and honeymoon here, and honeymoon here, and honeymoon here. And I'd love to go on a couple of honeymoons, babe. Maybe we will sometime. But the idea is that you have to live here, and it's uncomfortable. Praying for one another and bearing one another's burdens is not comfortable. You start finding out that other people are just as sinful as you are. All of a sudden, you start thinking, wow, I thought I was in a room full of perfect people, and I'm not. We're all broken, sitting at the gates called beautiful, needing God to come and heal us, and it's uncomfortable. But I believe God is in the uncomfort. God is right there bringing us together, and that's what it means to be connected. That's what it means to show up, to sacrifice. That uh, There's this statement, and I love this quote because it's from Spider-Man. It says, um, it says with great power comes great responsibility. Right? Everybody's seen Spider-Man. Yeah, AJ's thumbs up. Uh, But here's what's interesting, is that if you actually flip the nouns, it says, with great responsibility comes great power. See, I think that actually makes more sense for us. With great responsibility comes great power. That once you and I connect, we start building this connection, and we're conduits, we're interceding for one another, we're going to bat for those people that are around us and far from us, people that we love and that we hate. We have a responsibility But if you've invited Jesus into your heart, you have a responsibility. But with that responsibility comes great power, if you'll see it that way. So we have to be courageous. We have to be concerned. and We have to be connected. And in Acts 3, it says, so he jumped up. This is the end of the story. He says, so the lame man jumped up, and he stood, and he started walking. And he entered the temple complex with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Can you imagine what that would have been like? To be in that temple, and all of a sudden, the guy that everybody had been passing for months, years, starts running through the room, you would think, wow, this is unreal. And in verse 9, it says, all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized that he was the one who used to sit and beg at the beautiful gates of the temple complex. So they were filled with awe and astonishment at what had happened to him. See, I believe that the victory that we see in others becomes the epiphany that we all need. When we go to bat and we pray for others' needs and we see that need met, it becomes the epiphany moment that God is alive, he's real, he's working in our world today. But we only see that epiphany moment when we enter into connection and relationship with others. When we begin to bear one another's burdens and bear one another's needs, we begin to celebrate as well. That that's part of the, the beauty of community is that we all suffer together, but we also get to celebrate together. And so I believe we have a divine responsibility to step into community, to begin to invite other people into our community, that we're not a closed-off community, but we're open to those to come in and be a part of what God is doing here. But I believe we have to fight this, this desire to be alone, to carry our own burdens, to suffer and struggle alone, to not let others in on what we're dealing with. That we keep fighting this sort of need to be self-sufficient, to self-sustainable and self-important That God never designed you to do life by yourself. He never designed you to be in an island. He designed us to be in community and tribe. He designed us to bear one another's burdens. And so you could come up to me today and you could tell me what you're struggling with. And I can guarantee you it's not going to be something that someone else hasn't struggled with. But the idea is that so many of us, we feel like it's just me. It's only me. 
that I'm the worst, that I'm doing the, the, the worst, and I can't struggle. And so we don't want to take on anybody else's burdens because we're struggling too, but so often the very thing that you need is the thing that you give. And it's once we start giving that and we start praying for others that we start seeing our needs met too. And so that's what I want us to do this morning is I want us to turn our focus off of self and on to others. I want us to take a moment this morning and I want us just to take the focus off of what you need right now and I want you just to begin to imagine what someone around you might need. Now, if you don't know somebody with a need, then I want you to begin to imagine some uh, a child in a, in a third world country who doesn't have food this morning. You can do imagine someone in a third world country who doesn't have resources, a bathroom, or clean water. You can begin to imagine someone somewhere in the world that is not as blessed as you are. And we can begin to focus on that for just a moment. So if you would, just bow your head and close your eyes this morning. Let's begin to find someone who has a need. Begin to think of that need. See, when it's a face, it changes. When it's just an idea, then it's not important. But when it's a face, it's a person, it's a name, it's a soul. It takes on a whole new meaning. So we begin to imagine there are people waiting for God to reveal to them who he is. That we have this responsibility and now we've been given this power. So let's begin to pray for others. So where you are, just begin to petition God on their behalf. Just begin to say a prayer just to yourself. Just begin to pray that God would intervene in their situation, that he would intercede, that he would meet them where they are. That he would bring them hope and love and joy and peace, comfort and prosperity. So God, we pray. We pray for our enemies. We pray for our loved ones. We pray for our politicians. We pray for our, uh, those in authority. We pray for our community. We pray for our city and our state. We pay for, pray, pray for all humanity. That it is your will that they all come to the knowledge of who you are. And so we pray that the people that have yet to understand who you are would have an epiphany. They would begin to see you. As you begin to meet needs, may there be no denying that you are actively involved in our lives. And so we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would go ahead and stand across the room. For more information on our church and how you can support the ministry, you can visit us online at hamiltonlifechurch.com.